And Sernig, your head of interpreting at the translation school in Germersheim in Germany. This is one of the biggest and most prestigious schools in the world. I'd like to know how long you've been there, quite a long time, and how your ideas about translation and interpreting have developed over that stage. Mm. Yeah, actually, it has a lot to do with Kermersheim, and you're right, I started there in the early 70s, nearly 28 years ago, and when I started there, uh, at the same time actually that Paul Kuzmo also started, Hans Vermeer was teaching in Germersheim. He was a professor there teaching linguistics courses, but it was a time of fermentation, you could say. He was dissatisfied, as many of us were, with the way um, teaching uh, courses were run, and uh, we were all sort of thinking of new approaches. And at the same time, we were not terribly uh, impressed by what was then called translationstheory and uh, that's so this tra translation theory. Translation theory, yes. yeah, mm -hmm. if that's the word, mm -hmm. <laughs> in those days, um, which was more of the sort of comparative kind. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was in the 70s, late 70s actually, that Hans Vermeer wrote his first uh, articles uh, on his way to a Scopus theory. I remember in 78 he wrote a very important article, Ein Rahmen für eine allgemeine Translationstheorie, the framework for a general translation theory, which uh, already uh, was basically a Scopus theory. And that stimulated Paul and myself. At the same time, Katharina Reis was also teaching courses in Germersheim, and uh, we all uh, uh, had to made contact with uh, Christiane Nord, who was at Heidelberg, so there was a nice little group of people. And I think it was a very dynamic uh, give and take process in those days, and uh, Paul and I then decided to write a book, which uh, were, was published in 82, Strategie der Übersetzung. Translation uh, Strategies. Translation Strategies, you could say, yes. Which was, uh, I wouldn't say, um, s imitating Scopus theory, but it, it, I think it was certainly it put um, functional theories onto the market for the first time. And um, actually, we were first uh, because uh, Katharina Reis and Hans Vermeer published uh, their um, bestseller book in '84. Right. later. You, you would count yourself as a member of that Scopus school of thought? Well, I was certainly influenced by Scopus mm -hmm. theory. I would prefer for my talking uh, for myself, and probably also I could include Paul Kuzmol in mm -hmm. this. We are functionalists, I would say. Yes, we well, are. What, what yeah. do you mean by, by Scopus here or functionalism? Is it easy to explain? All right. This? Well, functionalism basically is a, a form. Uh, uh, functionalism puts the uh, target audience, the recipient, and client satisfaction. Um, at the top of all priorities. Mm -hmm. That's in, in very simple terms mm -hmm. what it's all about. Mm, whereas the Scopus theory um, would agree with that, of course, but Scop uh, what Hans Vermeer tried to do, I think, and, and still is trying to do, is bringing in all kinds of uh, other disciplines. His work has not been so much uh, uh, concentrated and focused on teaching translation, whereas I see myself basically as a trainer mm -hmm. of uh, professional translators, and as perhaps a little bit of biographical detail uh, will explain this. My wife has been working as a professional translator, so I get a lot of feedback from her. So I've always tried to uh, write a sort of theoretical, uh, or rather uh, reflect, shall we say, on the practice of translation, um, keeping abreast of, of what has been written, but trying to, to uh, use it for actually better training. You find no conflict then between this Scopus approach, which is a professional approach, emphasizing the target reader, and your pedagogical duties as a trainer? Not at all. I would say quite the opposite, actually. Mm -hmm. I find it much easier and uh, far more 
convincing actually uh, to to use this uh, recipient focused approach you've also written a book uh, called constructivus you yeah. uh, constructive translation yeah yeah is that yeah. in the same line or is this term a departure well it certainly is uh, on the same line perhaps I should I, I love metaphors uh, Anthony mm -hmm. and analogies and uh, Perhaps I can best explain by using uh, this analogy. In Germany, the metaphor, which uh, has been is, is, is used very often for translation, is that of a ferryman ferrying the goods across the narrow straits, whatever, or a sailing ship. So there's this precious cargo of words and it's uh, hoisted on board and then the ship sets sail and gets these goods intact to the other side. Now, constructive, what, what I understand by a constructive approach to translation is a different uh, paradigm, a different analogy. It's bridge building. And it's not so much a horizontal activity, it's a vertical activity. A bridge builder will have to understand how to erect a bridge. The bridge, in this uh, uh, metaphor, of course, is there to facilitate communication across language and, and cultural barriers. But an expert translator, or interpreter for that matter, has to be able to build a bridge. Not just to ferry across, there has to be a real constructive work. He has to know about currents in this, and, and uh, he has to know about uh, pillar construction, if I translate that now into the real world of, of translation, uh, I mean by that he has to know about uh, textual analysis, analysis, he has to know a lot about the actual material he uses, i.e. language. It would probably also help if he knows not only about uh, the software language, but also a little bit about the hardware, and that is the brain, I suggest. It would also help to, to know about domain knowledge, how it is acquired, these are the pillars of my bridge. And when I, so when I talk about a construct, constructive approach to translation, I mean both. I mean, it, it is constructive in the sense that it will help the client or the recipients, and it is constructive work. And it is not uh, an art or, or something uh, which, which some geniuses uh, may, may uh, be able to do without any preparation. It is hard work. Professional translation is so is interpreting. And you you've uh, done then these two books, which have translation übersetzen in the title. Yeah. And yet you're head of interpreting now in Germersheim. Yeah. What for you is that fundamental difference between written translation and interpreting? Is that a big jump? Well. Hmm. This is really, uh, we could be here all night, Anthony. This is a fascinating question, uh, if, I answer, if I answer this in detail. Um, what are the main differences? Or in the way they're you know, taught, perhaps. Since yeah. Yes, teaching and translation, teaching and interpreting. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's, uh, if when you teach interpreters, he has no motivation problems. That's number one. Interpreters obviously want to become interpreters. Not all of, of those students who attend translation classes, at least in my, uh, in Gammersheim, want to become translators. Actually, uh, only about 50% really want to work as professional translators. Best the interpreters, the interpreting students, all want to become uh, professional interpreters. All right, that's on the surface. Now, <coughs> if you take a, a closer look, the difference to me seems to be that interpreters naturally have a macro strategic or strategic approach to interpreting. What do I mean by that? Interpreters know that they have to rely on their reflexes when they're actually in the booth. There's no way they can look upwards in dictionaries or consult somebody. This is it. They have to, to work with whatever they brought into the booth. And that means that you don't have to tell an interpreter to prepare himself or herself for the job. They know that it's, 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 it will save their life if they do, and if they won't, they'll just perish. 
Again, let's look at translators, or rather, students training to become translators. There, you see the difference. You have to tell, you have to motivate uh, uh, students uh, training to become professional translators to do research, to prepare for the job. They sometimes, many of them actually, particularly those in the first and second years, feel that, why? What's the problem? I look at the text, if I don't know the word, I look it up in a dictionary. End of story. Whereas in, in interpreting, it's a, it's a different story altogether. So interpreters have a natural advantage, I feel. And a second natural advantage is, of course, that they do real interpreting jobs right from the beginning. In they, your, in they, your of course, program. in our training yes. program, they sit there in the booth, they are faced with a, with a, a speech, either given live, or improvised, or on video material, and they, they have all the equipment, they have all the conference equipment which, which they'll work with later on. So again, this is a real life situation which is another tremendous advantage. We find it very difficult to simulate real translation jobs in our, in our um, translation courses. Although some of us try very hard, particularly my colleague Don Carali. I, I have the impression there that a lot of theory is done about written translation but far less on interpreting. Very true. Is that yeah. Um, well, perhaps I can afford to be a bit mean here. Mm -hmm. uh, there, is, there, there isn't much research in, and, and unfortunately I have the impression that uh, quite a few authors who have written on training interpreters reinvent uh, the wheel. A wheel which has been described in translation studies and was described some 20 years ago. In other words, uh, for instance, that, uh, that obviously meaning does not reside in words. I think that that's fairly clear and has been fairly clear in, in translation studies for at least 20 years, if not more. Whereas in, in many, or in quite a few publications I've read in the field of interpreting, this seems to be a fairly new idea. So, I am, my, one of my next projects will actually be to, to try and integrate to the two disciplines a bit more, as I actually am trying to integrate interpreter training um, approaches into translator training. Great. Do you think, this is a nasty question, you're, you're German, you work in Germany with German students, do you think you have a particularly German approach, or even that, that Scopus target framework is a particularly German product. <coughs> All right. Scopus is, I agree with you. I think the Scopus approach is, and I'm very, I'm very glad that when you asked me before, 10 minutes ago, I said, I'm not really a Scopus man, I'm a functionalist. Mm -hmm. So, to come back to the first part of your question, I don't really consider myself a, a typical German kind of scholar. Um, my books, uh, are written in the Anglo-Saxon tradition, really. I write in German, or most of my publications are in German, a few things I've written in English, but I with a firm eye on the uh, recipient reader. And it is my, my, my greatest hope is really to do something for professional translators. Mm -hmm. I want to improve standards, I want to provide material for them to, to be able to argue with their clients which is a large part of their job. You argue against the client or...? Well, I don't have to tell you that often there are kinds of very funny queries you get from your clients. They can turn into arguments, they don't have to, but you have to prepare for all kinds of awkward questions like why didn't you use this word and, and I, I spent two weeks in America and I heard this. You know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And it's part and parcel, I think, of, 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 a, of a job as a translator to have a good answer for that. Right. Mm -hmm. And Sir you're, you're, you're married, you have a daughter. And a son. And a son. Have you encouraged them to go into translation or interpreting? Would you? Should you? Should one? Now, uh, that is really a mean question. No, no I did not. No, I did not. Um, my children both are, well, relatively bilingual, shall we say, um, but they never actually uh, were interested in becoming translators. So I did not, of course, I mean, would make any sense for me to say, hey, I want you to become a translator or interpreter. 
But funnily enough, they never had any interest. My, my son is an astrophysicist and my daughter studied law, both in England. Um, now, I know what you, you of course, uh, what you think of. You think of the future, probably, of the profession. Mm -hmm. What? Yes. How do I see it? Well, um, it's in interpreting, I think we have um, two market, uh, markets, mm -hmm. the, the freelance market and the institutional market. And it seems to me that the two markets are, the, the, the gap widens between the two. Uh, well, I don't want to, to attach any labels, but I see in the institutional market, I see a danger for interpreters to become cogwheels uh, with not much uh, freedom and, uh, and uh, not much liberty uh, functioning uh, in, in a big, big uh, institution. Are, are you talking about the European institutions here? I'm I, I might be I might be thinking of the European institutions. Yes. yes, I might be thinking of them. Yeah, yeah. The freelance market is is uh, becoming ever more diversified. Uh, it's it's a very challenging market, and it seems to be elastic because most of our students actually want to go into the freelance market, and we we always think how many people can this freelance market actually uh, find employment for? And surprisingly enough, there seems to be work for our graduates. Uh, they all, after some hard times, end up working as freelance, or not all, but most of them, as uh, freelance interpreters. Yet you're implying there that there's a risk in the field of interpreting of focusing too much on the European institutions, on the skick, if we must put a name on things. Yeah. Is that yes. the implication? I, <coughs> well, all right, in training. Sorry, the I think the skick is the... Um, the, the joint, joint interpret tr interpreting service of the European yes. uh, community. Yeah, yeah. But it is, of course, but, uh, the most important, uh, um, uh, they are the most important employer. And, but I see a danger for, for training institutions like yours and mine to, uh, to so we say, uh, focus exclusively on this kind of market. We don't. We, have a, we are running both a postgraduate course now within the Euro, Euro Master program alongside our traditional program, which is an undergraduate program. So I plead for a sort of peaceful coexistence between the two. Mm -hmm. And where I do feel a bit uh, pressured and get a bit annoyed is when people try and sell me postgraduate models as the only possible way to professional interpreter training. So I don't in Germany, in your programs are... Uh, well, in Germany, our workers are undergraduate, but there's mm -hmm. quite a bit of pressure from outside and actually also from inside in Germany to change it. People say, why should interpreters actually go to university at all? This is more sort of vocational training. Let them go to uh, polytechnics and, and this is and, and, and all that. And uh, well, we can't go into detail, obviously, within the short uh, time slot provided. But there I feel very defensive uh, of the uh, German uh, model and German way of training professional translators, uh, interpreters. Sure. So if we were having this conversation in 10 years' time, for example, do you think we would be discussing the same issues or would we have moved on? Hmm. What about, I'm thinking of translation and interpreting as being two distinct fields, for example. Yeah. Well, I think in, in, in Germany now, the, the level of consciousness of, on, the, on the side of employers and clients is far higher than it was, say, 10 years ago, as far as the differences are concerned between interpreters and translators. 10 years ago, or even five years ago, uh, uh, people would look for translators when they really wanted interpreters. Uh, it does still happen sometimes, but there's far more consciousness now, far more awareness now in Germany that there is a difference between interpreting and, uh, and translators. And there's also a growing demand for quality work. That I, think is, that, I think, is a big encouragement for our students because I don't have to tell you that there are so many amateur translators on the market, also amateur uh, interpreters, uh, we work for ridiculous uh, fees and uh, obviously our graduates cannot compete with them because they have to make a living doing this. So it is, it is very important for us to have an awareness on the side of the clients and of the public to understand what quality work really means. And I'm very hopeful there in Germany. Also in some Eastern European countries I visited, 
that gradually there is an awareness of, of quality work. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, there's a scope for development. And uh, coming back to your question, it's not, I, I didn't uh, tell my children to become, uh, not to become interpreters because I see no future in the profession. That would certainly not be true. I mm -hmm. see the tremendous future in both professions, actually. Oh, yes. Fine. Yeah. That's it. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.